Thank you for watching our online service. At Cedar Grove Baptist Church, we exist to lead people to become passionate followers of Jesus Christ in their community and around the world to the glory of God. And the key to it all is the glory of God. This service today is presented to you as an opportunity for you to draw near to God. And we know what glorifies God the most, and that is when we love Him with our heart and our mind and our soul. So we pray that this service will be that very thing that will help you to accomplish that end today. To love God with your heart, mind, and soul, and in the end, glorify Him to the fullest. Thank you for watching. Good morning, church. It's so good to see you today. If you would, stand up on your feet. We're going to worship together this morning. Just celebrate the God who calls us by a new name. Amen.
There's someone in this room today who needs to speak that truth over their own life, that I'm chosen and not forsaken, that I am called by God to be who he says that I am, not what my past says I am, but what Jesus has called me into. So let's just sing that together this morning. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. Let's proclaim that today. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. This is true.
Jesus today. Give him praise in this place. He's a good God, amen. Amen. Now you may be seated for just a moment. We're going to move into a time of something that may be unfamiliar to you, but um, it may not be. It's what's called a responsive reading, but we're going to read Romans chapter 8 together this morning. How it's going to work is Brooke's going to come over and she's going to say a verse, and then I want you all to say a verse. When it says congregation, it'll say leader for Brooke and congregation for you all. And, but as you read this, don't just read it to keep up. Don't just read it to, to read some words and be a part of a Sunday morning service. Read it and let it sink in and soak in what Jesus says to you and I today. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. that leads to death. Those who were dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are not controlled, or you are now controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give you life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. And now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, living together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies that he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't have yet, we must wait patiently and confidently. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son. So that we would be firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. What shall we say then about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us when God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? 
no one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Can we just give him praise this morning, church?
Jesus, it's only because of what you have done for us that we can come and approach today. We can come near to you because you have taken down that veil that separated us from you. Your death on the cross, whenever you went in the ground, the veil of the temple tore, set, showing that the, the Spirit of God was now able to come close to us. You have paid the price for our sin. And so, God, that is why we are able to worship you freely and fully today, knowing that we are yours forever. God, be with us now as we open up your word. I pray you would speak now through Billy. Speak through your, your scripture today, God. We point our eyes to you. In Jesus' name, amen. As our children make their way to Children's Church today, uh, Vacation Bible School is just a... Um, a week and a day away. So if you have not signed up and your children, please go online and sign up and that will save us from having to go through all of that once you get here. But if you would like to participate and be a helper, uh, there's still ways that you can help. Uh, you can check with Miss Susan, call the church office, and, uh, and we'll make a way for you to be involved. Man, aren't you glad you came to church today? Aren't you glad we read Romans 8? Uh, aren't you glad that that very first verse of Romans 8 just really uh, should be the very thing that makes us want to run out of here and run all the way home and pick up our car later? And that is that there is therefore now no condemnation. I mean, don't we live in a world that is heaping down condemnation on everybody, every day, everyone is being condemned today. And yet the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. The beauty of knowing that, the joy of knowing that in Christ there is liberty. That passage that we read just a moment ago in Romans 8 says that, that this present suffering, and I look out here and I see people that know present suffering. Many of you in this room have present suffering. You know, people like Miss Sharon's going to have her knee replaced on Tuesday. And people like Becky Simpson back there just found out this week from a bad doctor's visit that, that she's going to have to have a PET scan. And, and she's fought cancer and, and, and there's an indicator that there's something else going on there, some suspicious areas on her body. You know, when, when I heard James Spurgeon's brother is in the hospital, hard times, people go through them, Right? But can I tell you, the Bible says that this present suffering cannot compare to the future glory that we have in Christ Jesus. That passage that we read as a church while ago, just a moment ago, it says, for I am persuaded. He talks about those things. He says that all things are good. All things work together for good. Not all things are good, but God is good in the midst of all things, right? And that God, whatever the things and circumstances are in our life today, God has predetermined, preordained that whatever it is in your life today will help you to be more like His Son. For God, for those He did foreknow, He did predestine to be conformed into the image of His dear Son, the lovely Lord Jesus. The joy of knowing that no matter how we walked in here today, we can walk out of here knowing what it means to be more like Jesus. So today, for a few moments, as you can tell, I'm not the guy in the bulletin. That's uh, Jeff. Jeff got caught up in Tokyo, and uh, he was from Indonesia, and he was going to be our Gideon guest today. And, and uh, so we were excited about it. I was until I found out he wasn't coming. So when I found out he wasn't going to be here, I realized I had to be here. So uh, um, today I'm going to do something that honors the Word of God, and I'm going to preach the Word of God. And I'm going to preach it. I'm going to preach the Word of God as it speaks to us in 1 Timothy chapter 2. And I want you to take your worship bulletin. There's a notes part in there. All you got to do is write down three large P's, okay? P, P, P. And if you've got to do that, you can wait after the service. But P, 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 all right? 
I want us to think about the P's that are involved in the Christian life. When Paul wrote 1 Timothy, Paul was my age. Actually, I was older than Paul when he wrote 1 Timothy. In fact, Timothy was about Nathan's age. So Paul had met him while on a missionary journey. And Timothy at that time when he met him was just a a teenager, maybe even a teenager, some people think. But he was not your ordinary, run-of-the-mill young person. He was a man that had been brought up right, taught right, believed right. Paul saw things that were in him that were right. And he invested his life in, in the young Timothy's life. And then now Paul, years later, fast forward, he's, he spent a stint in, in jail in Rome. He's been under house arrest. He gets out for a little while. And then Nero, he carts him right back to Rome. And this time he dies. But Paul doesn't go out feeling sorry for himself. Paul goes out writing notes and writing letters and reminding people that this body of Christ, this kingdom authority that we have in this life is from God. It is of God. The church is God. It's not man's. It's not mine. And it's not going to be yours, Ephesus. It's going to be God's. So here Paul writes to Timothy, who is there in Ephesus trying to right some wrongs in Ephesus because the church had run off the track. And Paul's writing to, to, to young Timothy, and while Timothy is there laboring there in Ephesus. And what Paul is saying to Timothy is what Paul, I think he says to us. And that is this, is that why don't we become a blessing? I mean, why be a blessing? We've been talking about all the whys this summer. Why not be a blessing? Why don't we just understand that being a blessing means that, that we can bless God and bless somebody else all at the same time? And that's the beauty of being a blessing for God. That's the beauty of understanding that God wants us to be a blessing. In fact, before I read verse number 1 of chapter 2, I want, to, I want you to listen to what Paul said to Timothy in verse 18 of chapter 1. Timothy, my son, I'm giving you these, this instruction in keeping with the prophecies previously uh, made about you so that by recalling them, you may fight the good fight, having faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected those and have shipwrecked their faith. I'm going to tell you, you can look in any direction in this church and there are people that are not here because they have shipwrecked their faith. They shipwrecked it. Nobody else is responsible for that but them. Nobody can take that, 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 that authority over their shipwrecked life but them. But the fact is they want to blame anybody and everybody that will stand still long enough to listen to them. And the fact is they've shipwrecked their faith. Paul said, listen, Timothy. There are people there that have shipwrecked their faith. Among them are Hymenius and Alexander, who I have delivered to Satan so that they may be taught not to blaspheme God. Paul called names. My God, imagine that if, in Twitter sphere. If Paul would have said that and Twitter was around or if Facebook was around, that Paul had the audacity to call out somebody. Why did he do it? Because he wanted everybody to know this is what a shipwrecked life looks like. This is what happens when you take authority over your life. This is what happens when you let the Word of God become not primary, not even secondary, somewhere way down the list in your life. This one is when, what happens when you let your feelings or let your emotions take over your life. You can shipwreck it. And then Paul starts by making this absolute reminder to young Timothy. He says, first of all, first of all, he says, first of all, I want you to know this. He says, first of all, then I urge that petitions and prayers and intercession and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all of those who are in authority. In other words, what Paul is saying, prayer must be a priority. Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, I know Ephesus is difficult. It's probably harder than you ever dreamed it could ever be. The church is filled with shipwrecked lives. 
They're hurting people that are in the wake of, of the casualties of shipwrecked lives. And this is the number one thing you are to be about doing. First of all, then. First of all, he makes it clear. First of all, that means whatever you do, make sure this is the first thing you do. And he's talking about prayer, isn't he? He says, first of all, that I urge that petitions and prayers and intercessions and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all of those who are in authority, just so you'll know, Nero is getting ready to burn Rome. And when he burns Rome, they bl he blames it on the Christians. And the Christians are going to be open game to anybody and everybody. And Christianity is under attack even before Nero burns Rome. So Christianity that Paul was speaking of and, and the people that Paul was talking of was people like Nero. People that were in authority. People that, 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 that have the ability to choose whether you live or die or, you're, or you're, you're, your community is destroyed or not destroyed. Paul said, this is what I want you to do. I urge you, the most important thing you do, the main thing you do in your life, make sure that you pray. And you pray for those. First of all, he says, I urge. And that word urge is a parakaleo. It's a beautiful word, actually. That, that word by itself means to, to call alongside, to encourage, or, or, or even a word of command. What Paul is saying, I'm urging you. I'm calling you. I am commanding you, Timothy, to pray for these people. That is a powerful statement, isn't it? Paul's saying, I want you to pray for them no matter how good or how bad they are. Pray for them. No matter how moral or immoral they are, pray for them. No matter how just or unjust they are, pray for them. Our job as a Christian church, especially our job as Christians, are not to pray for people we like so that we can like them more. It's to pray for people that can't stand the thought of us. Or even assembling here today would detest some people. Why? Because Christianity needs to be silenced. Paul is saying, those are the people we pray for. We pray for them. We pray whether they like it or not, we pray. And he urges them, first of all, I want you to pray for them. Pray for them. All of those who are in authority, all of those, whether they're kings or whoever it is, pray for them. E.M. Bounds made a statement. Mr. Fortenberry quoted something he said last week at our service, but E.M. Bounds said this. He says, what the church needs today, we all got a list of that, right? If I stopped it right there, we've all got that list. What does Cedar Grove need today? What does the church in general need today? Listen to how Ian Bounds looked at it. He said, what the church needs today is not better machinery, not new organizations, or more and novel methods. I mean, look at him. What Ian Bounds needs is a makeover. He needs spiked hair, a t-shirt on, and high-top $700 tennis shoes so that everybody can listen to him. No, he's sitting in a straight back chair. My goodness, I wouldn't even want my grandkids to be in the same room with him. Look at him. Let me tell you something about Ian Bounds. He knew what it meant to be in the room with Jesus. He spent time with Jesus. He believed the power of God was in spending time with Jesus. He said, we don't need more machinery. We don't need better organizations. We don't need any novel methods. What we need is people who the Holy Spirit can use. People who are mightily in prayer, mighty in prayer. People that pray. The Holy Spirit does not flow through methods, but through the people of prayer. Let me tell you something. You want to bless America? You want to bless God? You want to bless your family? You want to bless your church? You want to bless all of those who come in contact with you? Be a person that prays. 
Samuel Chadwick said it this way, the greatest concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, or prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil and mocks our wisdom. But make no mistake about this, Chadwick says, the devil trembles when we pray. When we pray, the devil trembles. Andrew Murray said the person who mobilizes the Christian church to pray will make the greatest contribution to work evangelization in history. <laughs> I mean, Charlene says here today, love life. We're going to be in love life. We're going to participate in love life. We're going to go to Planned Parenthood. We're going to stand out front. We're going to pray around Planned Parenthood. Why do we do that? We don't just get there and sing Kumbaya, pat each other on the back and go somewhere else. No, praying. Why do we pray? Why would we even consider praying in a Planned Parenthood building? Because lives are ended there. And why do we pray that lives can be changed there? We pray. That's, that's what Murray said. Spurgeon said, I would rather teach one man to pray than ten men to preach. That was Spurgeon's statement. We must pray. We must pray for our for our mates, for our children, for our families, for our church family, for the men and women who serve this nation, whether politically elected or people that are on the front lines in our community, whether they're the police officers or frontline servants, soldiers around the world, we must pray. We must pray at church. We must pray at home. We must pray at work. We must pray at play. We must make prayer a priority in our life. I ask you the question today. What does prayer sound like in your home? What does prayer sound like in your family? Does the people that you work beside, do they have a keen awareness that no matter what goes on in their life, that you are praying for them? Even if they don't believe in prayer, they know you believe in prayer. Do they know that? Should that not be what we are about as people of prayer? That's why Paul says, I urge you, first of all, I urge you that you'll do these things. That urge you that, you, that, that petitions and prayers and intercessions and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all of those in authority. He uses the word petitions there. You know, there are prayers that you can't answer. You can if you hear of something that's going on in someone's life and you could flesh, in your own flesh, walk up and be an encouragement in their life or help them through a crisis in their life, then let me tell you something. That is a petition that, that asks of you to pray for them that you can literally put feet to that prayer. You can do something about it. There's just some things that you can do about, do something about. And there are petitions in our life that request that bearing one another's burdens, helping someone carry the weight of their life, the load of their life. Man, that's something we can do. He says not only petitions, but also prayers. He uses that word prayers there, and that means that, that there are just some things that are going on in people's lives that only God can do. Only God has the power to fix this. Only God has the power to heal that broken heart. There are people that go through enough pain in their life over a process of their lifetime stacked on top of each other. Only God can fix this mess. Only God. Those are those prayers that we cry out to God that only God can get the credit for and only God can do. Those are prayers. I was in my mom's house last Friday for a little while and going through some drawers and some cabinets and I hadn't done that since she's been gone over four years and I just sat there and want to turn a five gallon bucket upside down I just sat there and pulled out a drawer and set it on a chair and I started going through pictures and things that she kept and, and reminiscing and gosh it was going to take days to go through that and I just sat there and I thought 
My goodness, all of these things, all of the stuff that mom walked through in her life, every bit of that, and yet she still kept on being mom. And the greatest single day in her whole life is when she became a follower of Christ. All these years of being married to a raging alcoholic and becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. And then just look at all of those things and be reminded that, that all of those pictures, there were times when we were kids growing up and I saw my dad smile and, and everything was happy. Happy, happy. It was so happy till it was not happy. I'm going to go ahead and tell you something. In your life, it can be so good till it's not good. And what makes it not good? Well, in our cases, everything got upside down. Dad drank. Dad lived to drink. He didn't drink to live. He lived to drink. And then everything changed. The smiles went off as we got older. My dad, who was a strapping, good-looking, handsome man, walking off the front porch with a suitcase in his hand, and he and my mom going to start a life together, that beautiful picture. And I thought, my goodness, little did they know, little did mom know. But you know what? Why it may took everybody else by surprise. It never, ever one time took God by surprise. God was not surprised. And the whole idea of prayers, praying for someone, for God to intervene, is just understanding that while we do make those petitions and we make those prayers, but we also make those intercessions. We grab a hold of somebody and say, listen, if you go down, I'm going with you. If, if you get through it, I'm going to get through it with you. I'm going to intercede. I'm going to ask God to put this pain on me to relieve you from some of this. Do you know that? Do you know that prayer? That you are willing to take the weight, the pain, the intercession. And then Paul says, as a result of that, there will be thanksgiving. Why is thanksgiving? People are praying. Lives are changing. Hearts are being broken. That brings about thanksgiving. Thanksgiving unto God, so that, this is what he said, so that they may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. That word, that, what in the world is that there for, right? That is there for, for this reason. It connects prayer to what's coming next, and that is tranquility, that is peace. Because there is no peace apart from the power of prayer. There's none. You can legislate a lot of things, but you cannot legislate peace. Only God can bring peace. Prayer promotes that peace. Peter made this observation when he wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, Live such a good life among the pagans that they may accuse you of doing uh, uh, that. That though they may accuse you of doing wrong, that they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. My transgendering friend this week made a statement to me while I was around him or her. She's trying to be a him. She made the statement. And she said, I wish that I could have happiness in my life like you. Because every time I see you coming, Brother Billy, I, I look forward to talking to you. I'm going to tell you something. I, I felt like I'd gone through hell sideways that day. But you know what? I wasn't trying to fake it till I make it. I was just being a Christian, right? And I said, you know what? I can, I can tell you a sure of our way to overcome and be overcome and live a life of peace. She said, I think I know what you're going to tell me. I said, what do you think I'm going to tell you? Go to church. Oh, no. No, wrong. Go to Jesus. Give your whole life to Jesus. Don't give an hour of your time to a building. Give your whole life to Jesus. Jesus will change your life. 
Everything about your life can change. Prayer promotes peace. We must kill the beast within us so that we can have the peace of God within us. And the last thing I want to close with is this. Prayer brings peace. And prayer and peace brings purpose. I mean, look, your peace. Prayer, peace, purpose. Now the question, do you live your life on purpose? Or do you just live it by the seat of your pants? Every day you have no clue when you wake up in that day what I'm going to do if pre presented with this circumstance or that circumstance. Or, or do you just live just so winsome of just living your life without even a forethought of honoring God throughout that day? Let me tell you something. You're missing out on the greatest purpose of all. See, that prayer brings about peace. And that's why Paul said, Timothy, in Ephesus, they don't have peace. Pray for them. Pray for those who are leading that church. Pray for them that are astray. Pray for even those that are shipwrecked and have shipwrecked others by their shipwrecked lives. Pray, pray, pray. Pray in petitions. Pray in intercessions. Pray prayers. But be thankful when God answers and do this. He says, Paul says to him, said, this is good. And it pleases God, our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and humanity, and that is Christ Jesus himself, human, who gave himself a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. In verse 7, for this I was appointed a herald. Paul says, this is my purpose. This is your purpose, Timothy. You are God's spokesperson. You are on task for God. You are that person appointed as a herald, an apostle. And Paul said, I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. I am a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in truth. Paul says, that is my life. Everything about my life, from that road to Damascus to they cut, cut my head off on the Appian Way years later, a few years later, Paul never let his foot off the throttle of the purpose for his life. And the whole purpose was to make Jesus Christ known. The whole purpose was to help Gentiles come to faith in Christ. The whole purpose was to help people that no matter what they'd done, how long they'd been doing it, that there is freedom in Jesus. The whole purpose is to help people to know there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. The whole purpose was to remind them that this present suffering cannot compare to the future that you have in Christ Jesus. The whole purpose was reminding them that God, who is in charge, has predestined things to unfold in your life so that you can be like Christ Jesus. The whole purpose is to remind us all through this life there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. There's no death. There's no famine. There's nothing. There's no war. There's no darkness. There's no disease. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God that we have because we are in Christ Jesus. Paul speaks of that purpose. And friend, I want to ask you something. Do you see your purpose? Do you understand that God has a purpose for you? And as, as, as good as it is to look out and see you, I'm going to tell you, it is even better, would be even better, if every one of us said, okay, God, this is the purpose to make you known. It's to find someone before this day is done. And to make Jesus known to them by telling them what Christ has done in our life and what he's delivered us from. That's a purpose. The white Lyman Moody one day was bombarded by people that criticized him on everything he said. I mean, here he was, a, 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 just a dynamic evangelist. He was a street evangelist. He couldn't even go to bed at night and go to sleep unless he had shared the gospel with someone. Dwight Lyman Moody was so passionate about his faith that while he was living in Chicago, of all places, Chicago, 
Man, they need the white lime and moody now. But just imagine in that day, the white lime and moody could go into an apothecary or somewhere and he could inquire about someone's soul. And someone would cut off the white lime and moody and say, that's none of your business. And the white lime and moody would say, yes, it is my business. And someone would say, you must be the white moody then. Why? Because he had a passion for that. He'd go to bed at night and sometimes he'd find himself slipping off to sleep and realize that he'd been busy all day and not told the story of Jesus to no one. And he could not. He made a vow to himself that every day of his living life he would tell Jesus' story to somebody. And I remember reading in one of his first and earliest autobiographies where he was laying in the bed one night and it was storming. It was cold. A cold front was coming in. It was going to turn the rain into sleet and the sleet into snow. And Moody had had a long, dark, hard day. And laying there almost to slumber, he remembered the vow that he had made to God. The white lima Moody got up, dressed, and threw his overcoat and his hat on, and he walked out on the streets of Chicago, knowing that he'd walk all night because he's not going to find a soul out there in the weather like this. And he walked up to a man, leaned up against the building, right over a vent from a from an apartment building, leaned up against it to try to stay warm. The white lima Moody walked up to that building, leaned up against him. He says, sir, I have a question to ask you. Are you prepared to meet Jesus tonight? And that man said, no, sir. I've been leaning up against this building, wondering what needs to happen in my life for it to change. And the white lineman Moody said he prayed with that man. He got on his knees out there in that sleep. Turn, rain turned sleet on that grate, and that man cried and begged Jesus to be his Savior. When people criticized the white Lama Moody for his evangelistic zeal and efforts, he always came back. He said, tell me what you're doing. And most of the time, most of the time, they would be doing nothing but criticizing his he said, until you come up with a better way of reaching people, I'm going to stick with God's way. And I'm just going to do it till I die. And he did. Can I tell you what a purpose is? Is understanding that God has a plan. And that plan is for you to spend time with his word and spend time with him and, and grow to love him and know him and pray and cry out to him. There may be people that you would talk to about Jesus if you talk to Jesus about them. The very reason you're not talking to them about Jesus oftentimes can be hinged on the very fact that you don't even talk to Jesus about them. You have a lot quicker response to lost people when you talk to, law, to Jesus about lost people. When you start loving somebody and loving God more than that somebody, then you want the one you love the most to know the love that you know. That's purpose. That's how we bless God and bless America, bless our church, bless our families, bless our communities, bless the world. It starts with prayer. And then peace comes into our life. And along with prayer and peace, there is purpose. There is purpose. And that purpose is to live our whole life to make Jesus Christ known. To make him known. Let's bow for a moment. Father, in just a moment. When this invitation hymn is sung and we stand to our feet, I pray, God, that while we may stand in, be standing on our feet, that we be bowed before you on our knees and our heart.
that we'd be crying out to you, O God. That you may be the very one that would change everything in our life today. That we may be what Peter said, that our hearts may be set apart for Christ. And that we would be ready to give an answer of whoever would ask us for the reason for the hope that we have. And what we would have to say to them would be done so in love. It would be done so in respect. Father, there are people in our own family, God, that, that if we're honest we, we quit praying for them and when we stop praying for them then we stop talking to them they may get on our nerves they may just do things that just drive us crazy but God we are to pray we're to pray, God, that you would do in them what only you can do. There are people at our job, God, that are just, they're just a day away from giving up completely. And yet, God, you give us that place. And we thought it was just to, to pay a house off or to buy a car. But God, you have a greater purpose. Lord, even the person in line that we're drawn to at the grocery store, when we see them, Lord, we think it's just because they've been nice to us, but it could very well be that, God, you put that in us so that we can hopefully begin a conversation that will go even beyond the checkout line. And lives could be changed. A heart can be changed. A whole destiny can be changed because of you, Jesus. Father, I thank you, God, for that Romans 8 passage. I thank you, Lord, for those short little words that are in Christ Jesus. When we're in Christ Jesus, we have hope. When we're in Christ Jesus, we're not condemned. When we're in Christ Jesus, we have a future. And when we're in Christ Jesus, we have a now. You're our present help. You're the one that gives us purpose now. And we know that because we're in Christ Jesus. In just a moment, we're going to stand. And if you just feel the tug of God to just maybe to come kneel at this altar and pray if there's something or someone that is just heavy on your heart today and you'd just like to cry out to God for a few moments you can do that here today if you're looking for a faith family and you feel like this is the place that you'd like to be a part of and grow and be nurtured and encouraged and be a part of a small group then we invite you but that invitation is secondary to the primary, and that is, first of all, make sure that you know who Jesus is. Give your life to Jesus today. And we're here to help you to know how and to know the steps that you need to take. So if God is leading you to that end, we exist today to help you. In Jesus' name, let's stand. feel that God is calling you to prayer right now. As Billy just said, just uh, don't hesitate. Um, 
you've got that family member who's far away and you need to pray for them right now, then, then pray for them. Get on your knees if you need to. We'll sing in just a moment. I just want to leave some space here for those of us who need to pray. Good news.
wash away my sin. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can make me all again. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the Lord that makes me white as snow. its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name Jesus Christ my living Please, I challenge you today to, to read that Romans 8 passage. It's the Magna Carta of the Christian faith. Just fall in love with Romans 8. Read the epistles to Timothy. Read his last letter that he wrote before he died. When a dead man starts talking to you and he knows he's getting ready to go, then you sit on every word of it. When Paul wrote to Timothy that second little epistle to Timothy, it was at the end. He could hear the sword being sharpened in the background. He knew his head was going to be gone. But he couldn't, nobody, Nero couldn't get his heart because his heart belonged to Jesus. They can take everything else from you, but they can't take your faith away if your faith is in Jesus. You've had loss. So many of you have had so much loss. But oh, in Jesus, we have gain. We have so much gain in Jesus. May God remind us of that today.